Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our practical lecture 2.1 on really understanding MPI message exchanges, point-to-point -point communication, MPI collectives. So this is a really practical lecture where we look a little bit into the heart of MPI. And when you understand the content of this lecture, you essentially have understood MPI in its heart um, basically. So, of course, there are much more advanced MPI mechanisms, but when it comes to MPI, as the name suggests, message passing interface, you would think it's about messages and basically a high performance way of doing it. Before we go into this material, let us just quickly review what MPI is. And this is what we learned in the last lecture. We learned what parallel programming entails, and this is really changing the view from just using essentially a serial laptop, although of course laptops today more or less have um, multi-core chips and in this sense are parallel. But parallel programming here in this respect in MPI is really um, basically very explicit. So you would say you really think about each of the different message exchanges while many elements on your laptop are rather multi-threading and so forth. And we will make the difference when we use the U-turn cluster and we use different, uh, let's say, HPC machines. We started essentially with having fundamental MPI concepts. And uh, one that is really the, one of the key concepts is the so-called send and receive and the MPI point-to-point -point communication. Now, this is, of course, um, very simple in a way, but you see already in this diagram, if you want to send some data item from the memory space to another processor, in order to get new data, <clears throat> essentially it's, it's a little bit more elaborate. So we basically have these two processors and we know we basically cannot access a memory space um, directly from another processor to another. So that's why we have to send, if you want to do, you know, and use data somewhere on the other processor, we have to send this data over. And by doing so, we need to prepare this by having, let's say, space reserved for this data that is coming in and you see also, as we said the last time, single program, multiple data. Um, it could be also like in this basically diagram that the other processor has also already data basically in his particular variable for it. So preparing for the arriving new data in the so-called system buffer is one key concept of this. And essentially because we have here a very explicit send and receive point to point, we call it MPI point to point communication. And this is, let's say, a, a very trivial way in a sense to do so. Um, we will see then, um, basically, if you come to more elaborate codes, like we had here as an example, we looked then basically here on a glacier carving and basically a coupling of different MPI codes um, to really make this uh, glacier carving and this dynamic model really flying, you have here, um, essentially a so-called ELMA that you prepare with a mesh and then do a parallel run, let's say on 16 cores. And then you actually come over to a different code called HIDEM, uh, which you then prepare here in a serial way with Python and then program again in a more scalable version here in this code for this fracture and the calving then on 560 cores. So this is already, let's say a different elements of codes that are using MPI inherently. If you want to know more, there's also here the reference, but it just should give you a, let's say, elaborate example. Uh, when you look at this, how really MPI is used in practice today, what codes exists, how parallel computing can exist uh, to solve these problems here to understand better, for instance, glacier calving and, and the elements of these uh, scientifically. Of course, this goes to modeling. We will have more application examples as we move along with the course, especially in the second half of the course. But this is really the foundation. And when we think about this point-to-point -point communication that we just had described here, of course, when you scale up to something like 560 cores, alone 16 might be elaborate. But if you think about 560 cores here as an example, and then you want to do point-to-point -point communication with all, with all of these 560 cores, essentially, uh, you can imagine quickly you would have a very large code. And in this regard, so, and also thinking about that many parts that you simulate 
have always a kind of very much similar structure, as you see here with a wave propagation, perhaps, we have a butter solution. And this is called the MPI collective communication. Whenever you have much more processors involved and essentially doing more or less the same thing with them, there the MPI collective communication is, of course, much, much better than, let's say, do an iterative send receive and then loop around this to 560 cores. Uh, which would be a, essentially a relative bad MPI code, and we will come back to this. And you see that different MPI collective communication operations, this is very important to understand for the exam, for instance, this is often exams questions. So here you would have the MPI broadcast, where you really, let's say, uh, bring together one datum item and ship it to all the other involved processors inside a communicator. Uh, we come to the communicator later. But then basically here you see a scatter of an array, for instance, where you then have different data sent from one to many. And of course, then you can think about the, the other way around, like here, a many to one, where you would have then gather, essentially then bringing together from all the different processes, the data items back to one of the first processors. And then essentially we have seen with a reduce command, which was a very clever way of doing it. You have already operations with it. Here was a global sum that you can easily build to basically make your code much more readable to have these simple operations like multiplication, addition, uh, really already tackled as part of the collective operation. So this, this is basically MPI. And when we came to the more practical perspective of it, we actually connected it with the idea of scheduling. And if you remember, we had this Hello C program in one of the earlier lectures, and we said we have a C compiler and using a job script then to submit the C program then to the scheduler and gets executed. Now MPI builds on that. So basically we have a proper Hello C program, but of course our initial ways of doing Hello uh, World was not really anywhere parallel or had no idea of MPI, it was just Hello strings that have been four times executed by the scheduler. Now, we extended this example um, basically with this couple of lines. We did the MPI header include here and then still had uh, some interesting variables called rank and size, which basically after the init of the MPI environment can be actually um, filled by the MPI environment. We see here com size and com rank, which means that size gives you the overall you know, number of processors inside this MPI COM world or processes really. And then you can always determine your own unique rank. And this unique rank is important. We will see that throughout this lecture today in the practical lecture, how this can be useful in message exchanges and the application logic with it. So this is what the MPI environment gives you. And with this, it's very powerful. And then we basically have to finalize at some point in time and realize that only parallel uh, computing is really possible with MPI between these MPI in it and MPI finalize. And by doing this example, we did at least an addition to the hello world that basically each of the program, although it was exactly the same program, right? SPMD, same program, multiple data. So it was the same program, but here multiple data in the sense that rank gets differently filled by the MPI environment. And so that we could at least the last time show you a little bit on hello world that I'm, you know, one out of so many processors. And actually um, I will do this today as well when we think about it and I give you some example. We also discussed what is this interesting MPI com world. And this is the communicator, as we say, the space in which you do an MPI communication. Um, and basically you can have MPI com world in every MPI application because it's a basic communicator, including all the processes. processes. So when you then, of course, have more advanced elaborate examples, um, you basically can create your own group of processes. And basically with this, in, when you build a communicator in this group, you would then start again with new ranks, basically within this communicator. So the rank is valid for the specific uh, communicator you choose, which is an important factor. You see here from zero till um, nine, all the different ranks of these 10 uh, processes. But when you think about here, the group one and the group two, and you cut it into two, um, basically based on these ranks, and you build a new communicator, what is actually possible, and we will do in one of the subsequent lectures, then you have new ranks. 
Though the benefit is, of course, in communication that helps you tremendously and provide you more examples when we come today for ping pong, for instance, to really use messages, then this rank becomes incredibly important. And also, of course, then if you go to much more later lectures, we will have the so-called Cartesian communicator, which then also, of course, has a very much interesting systematic to it, as the Cartesian name suggests, there's a Cartesian grid idea for actually making the message exchanges much more streamlined, for instance, when you want to simulate here uh, wave propagation and then a boat on the waves, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially, we had still a conceptual lecture last time. I didn't show any pro examples, and many of you know assignment one is really directly related to it. So that's why today we have a practical lecture, more or less an additional element to what you have seen the last time. I will provide here some interesting examples where we start a little bit again from this MPI rank thinking, and I will show you basically how we come from a simple C program now to an MPI program. And really to understand this parallel environment is an important part of it. <clears throat> we will see the limit that actually our hello world with this MPI did not even did any message passing. So we will start with a simple ping pong application to really understand this point to point communication I was alluding to the last time. And then, with this, we also want to look a little bit how this is now reflected in the allocation in the job script when we come back to a U-turn and the job script where we specify the number of nodes, the number of cores involved. The second part then will be going into the MPI collectives. Uh, we will have there different types of message exchanges. Um, we'll come to some of them and really understand then the, the benefit between point-to-point -point collect and collective operations. Um, we will have some examples um, here, there, broadcast, but you know there are many other collective operations that you should also look into in your assignment. We basically conclude a little bit with a very practical concern and also understanding scheduling a bit more. Um, last time we had already alluded to this idea in the practical lecture 1-1 one, one, that there's scheduling, I have a JEP script, I send it via the batch system and it will schedule it sometime. But how do we know how the schedule looks like when we never know how long a job is actually running? That's why some people really have to define the wall time when you go to these HPC systems. And to understand what it means when you run against the wall and basically understanding this wall time job parameter is, of course, within your assignment. And by practically doing so in your assignment, you will understand this much more quicker. But here I give you also some small example on it. So. It's really just a demonstration here of how you do parallel programming, um, different abstractions, perhaps, if you have point-to-point -point communication versus collective operations. But I think it's really one of the foundations and approaches which you can always use and do HPC programming with any scientific domain-specific applications. If you look onto the deep code into this from these applications here um, that are running here as in base um, in different areas of science, they all go back to these let's say principles of operations we discussed today, like point-to-point -point communication elements, but then of course also a very broad usage of the MPI collective routines like broadcast, gather, scatter, or reduce. So fasten your seatbelt for a very interesting practical-based lecture. Still, I keep the pace here to a moderate degree so that everybody can follow and that you can actually use this material very much for assignment one. Uh, it goes without saying that again, the the elements here we do today is relatively simple still. And of course, we will come to lecture three, four, five, and we'll do much more interesting examples and pick also later and really application specific lectures again um, on these topics. And we'll understand much more what is the meaning really of broadcast? How can you do it wrong? Right. It will be also something when we look into some machine learning algorithms. But uh, this is something what um, will be coming to in later lectures. So again, for anyone who has never done this MPI, we start here really from scratch. And we start with the MPI point-to-point -point communication. I just already explained it, so let's go a little bit more to the practical idea of looking into this when we want to see here such an example of this hello world that I just explained, um, essentially being aware of itself as a process. For this, um, we know that already we have to go via SSH to Krafler here in my 
respect because I'm outside the university network here. But um, essentially, you already know um, this is something which you don't have to do when you are in the university network. Now you see I'm on Krafla. I will increase here a bit the editor and then from there I can log in into our HPC machine, Uton, here with my identity. There are no SSH keys or public keys involved, as you remember here in this university setup. So clear is a good command to really, after the login, essentially think where you are. And we have a list here of different directories from different courses. Let's dive again into the HPC course of this year. Um, although, um, of course, as I said earlier, the 2021 course is very similar on YouTube. Um, so basically, if you have interest to already look ahead and want to, let's say, prepare yourself already in advance for lectures, please feel free to go essentially to the 2021 because many of the aspects will be coming again. Of course, there will be always a couple of percent changes of materials, but the, the key essence, of course, of MPI remains things like parallel IO and so on, which is coming. So um, when we come to MPI, let's start here with the different examples we have. Of course, for us now, we want to understand what it is with Hello MPI. And when we here also go, now we are in this Hello MPI, we look what we have. Um, basically, now let's look what the Hello.c looks like. That was already essentially the same on the slide. Uh, you see here, again, we're filling with size and rank with the MPI comp size and MPI comp rank information. And this is incredibly important also for you in the exam to know. This is something what almost all MPI applications, if not all of them, um, basically will take advantage of. And you see here a typical string out with this placeholders here specifying I am the rank of the number of size, which means all the processes involved. I finalized it, say the program is done. So again, a very simple program, no message exchange. This is also what we see with this, right? When you look into this, we just printed out for each of the program, who am I, so to speak, in the ranks. And there's no message between, you know, point to point or broadcast. This will come later. Just to get you aware that basically you wouldn't write probably such a program because the idea of MPI, as the name suggests, is message exchanges. If you remember, we have to load the right modules, something what we already had in earlier lectures, modulo GNU, open MPI. Then we have the MPI basically and the compiler here where we have now our nice hello MPI C code. And I want to compile it, as I said, minus O is one opportunity to make it proper with proper output names you don't have to do it but i suggest to doing it and basically when we compile it there's no error and have now this executable here you see also that this binary executable is a lot a bit lot bigger here that also means it's really an executable file that we can actually then submit now finally to the scheduler from the scheduling we already know um, please don't do this on the login node we said we always want to have a proper job script and this is one of it. Um, we say here, for instance, we want now this hello world four times. This minus n alludes to how many cores I give the job. And basically the same idea that, of course, when you send it to this and you basically are there in a very, let's say, uh, freshly loaded environment, we first have to again load GNU and open MPI, so the real environment, and then can run the MPI essentially. And MPI run, will basically take care of distributing this four times, which is nice for us in combination with the scheduler, who is of course taking care of how many people are using the system right now. We can see this maybe with QStat, it looks pretty empty right now, which is very good. So when we now do, for instance, um, here the S patch and submit hello, then basically the QStat will probably see my name with my job. And we know from the idea of the hello world and so on, it's probably not the biggest job um, that exists. So it's probably already almost computed and completed. Um, we also said, um, if you remember, just as a quick back to the last time, uh, you see, we basically had here submitted in the queue of the scheduler, this batch job with this particular ID, which is also incredibly important because you see we track the status of the job essentially with this. 
but not only the status of the job, you will also notice once you did the submission, there is no output, right? Where is the output? We discussed it last time. It will be written into these files. You see here some old ones from last week, some of them from later, uh, from earlier this morning. Um, basically, where you have then um, now an output when the job is basically correctly coming out. You see here, we, this was a job ID we had and we basically computed. So essentially, we can go now into these. Remember also the double click with the mouse and then the right click with the mouse to get the name directly into the command line for those that are not so aware of Unix. And here you see what we a bit expected. Everybody in the ranks is aware of basically the own execution of the program on a different rank with a different process and still knowing how many processes are basically in the MPI COM world. And this will be very essential for much more complicated, um, very deep physics codes to understand. So because this is, of course, incredibly often used. Another important part of this is the, the output is never really the same. Um, it's not really deterministic. You can always say there are race conditions to write in this file, so to speak, from these different processors. So you can have also when you do this several, many times, uh, different, let's say, uh, numbers here in the ranks that maybe sometimes rank zero was first, ranks two was, you know, at this position and so forth. That's really important to realize um, that this, of course, is something uh, which is never the same. And there we have also but partly solutions for you. We call this MPI IO and then parallel file systems where you rather combine these sort of file system and file structures with MPI that rather than a serial file, so to speak. But these are advanced mechanisms. Just coming back to the slides that you see, everything I explained just is already for you also on the slides and partly also, of course, looking back to what we had the last time. So typical C program from our first lectures, we edited now the MPI init and EPA finalized, which always need to be there. It initializes, so to speak, the MPI environment and properly closes this. Never forget the MPI.h, the header files with having all the MPI function, otherwise the compiling will not work. And now really a key essence is to understand more and more this in this lecture that essentially we have still this SPMD ID idea. Um, and then with the interesting element of this MPI com world, I always know, even if I have here 10 executions of this particular Hello World MPI, for example, I always know or where it is just now executed from the perspective of one process, right? And they have all their unique identity with rank. And we have shown this um, in the output, um, basically that was very clear, but I want to stimulate with this also another element that you have seen. And basically that was that everybody was just of these processes, just you know pulling out something, uh, what size and rank they are and wrote it to the file and say, hello world. So essentially saying there is no communication, right? You see here communication, what we would say is a, is a key really by using MPI between these different ranks to use the net network interconnect really um, in order to send a message from rank zero to rank one and maybe back like a ping pong. This was not happening. We just had basically this execution on all these different ranks and this message change was not happening. So what happens, however, then if you need it, you can imagine here's a quick example, right? When you have, let's say clustering to do, like we do is with is one of our clustering algorithms. And this is of course a conceptual view on this, where you do different, let's say cores to work on this problem. So you will have to cut the input space in different pieces with all the data. Still, you want to have this, of course, as a, let's say the same cluster, although it's on different cores. So the position of these different points in order to cluster them, needs, of course, to be communicated and message changes are incredibly useful to do here. The same here between these different processors. And I think again, what I also was alluding to one of the lectures here, we use, for instance, 512 cores. You can imagine that I don't want to do, you know, basically send and receive uh, with this 512 cores. So essentially, then we would probably later also think more about broadcast and scaling up to much more processes. Um, and let's go there. So let's understand a bit what it really means to scale up then and not maybe knowing already how many cores you have for these processes. 
And you see that here a little bit um, that essentially you have always a serial part before the MPI initialize and determination of MPI environments, which comes back to serial elements. But from the parallel code perspective, here's a chance to really scale up. And we will show you basically later here in the second part, what it means to just change the job script with a number of cores available and suddenly the job, the same application logic will just working on 12 or 16 cores instead of four. So, and this is one of the key ideas of this inherent scalability I actually pointed here in with dot, dot, dot. When you think about what I just had with 512 cores, for instance, you really need to have something scalable because otherwise the code will be very tough if you have to do, let's say, point-to-point -point communication with all of them. So instead of having now this element, which was really no communication at all, we want to come to something called ping pong. So let's have a look on this, um, basically how that would look like. Again, I would go here perhaps a little bit into the practicals and then show you that the slides actually are showing you the same. So we leave the Hello MPI and basically we have here a next directory called ping pong. We already prepared a couple of things. Um, we want to go in a C code called ping pong C. And no surprises, you will find the MPI init statement, you will find the size and rank statement. So how many number of basically tasks or essentially how many processes are actually part of this communicate and I get my rank, which is now in this particular application incredibly important. I define here some other variables which are important uh, like the in message and out message, I will basically want to transfer in this ping pong and a couple of other things like rank and so on, but also destination and source. So destination and source for a point to point communication is obviously very important because you define it yourself. And you see that a little bit when we come now to this interesting statement here, that this is of course an important thing in context of the rank information. So here we see the first example in the course now, why the rank is such a benefit for us. So we cannot use it to do different application logic for different ranks in terms of just, you know, identifying here rank zero, for instance, and here rank one. That should be basically giving you the ping and the pong later, right? So for the ping, we would suggest that someone has to start this ping. And in order to start a ping, you can imagine I need to send. So we assume here that basically rank zero will start the ping with a send of this out message, the X, uh, basically then coming to, you know, just one character over the line from the type of MPI char to a so-called destination. So the destination is rank zero because I don't want to ping myself. I want to ping to another rank. And when I have, let's say, just two ranks here, I want to have it in rank one. What we also understood a bit from the conceptual lecture two, I hope, is of course this ball principle, right? If you have now a toddler you play with and the toddler throws a ball at you and you're not really ready to receive the ball, um, you knocked out or basically hurt yourself or basically it doesn't work, right? Hence we said for every send must be a matching receive. And you know, you should be able and be aware to receive when there's somewhere a send happening and then the ball game will fly. Right, then I also can successfully do a ping because I know the ping was received. And you see this a little bit here when we come to the rank one now. So here we basically have sent this um, to the MPI com world communicator and really addressed our rank one. Um, the tag is basically something which you can also put as some additional information MPI and there's some MPI status information that you can use, which is then basically put um, by the MPI environment to show what really was happening in the message exchanges. Um, and basically, if you look now for the sending that you have here of the um, out messages, um, basically you have this receiving of the in message. So then this in message would be filled by this X that's coming in. And essentially, you know, he has to specify how much you would expect and actually from where it probably will arrive. And this is, of course, in this particular part now, rank zero. And the tag MPI com world all the stays. The additional element is now that I received something so I can say there was a message exchange happening. 
So I can look into some status on this in order to get information what was really happening. Now, what I just described was essentially just a ping, right? It was point to point in the sense just once over the wire. Now, in order to get a pong, I need to do the same. And of course, to make it a proper ping pong, I need to do now and stand as basically here as the rank one and initiate now my sending. So I would start again with the out message. I would say, of course, it's just one char over the wire, so no big deal, but it, just, it is what we're interested in, a ping and a pong. And now the pong needs a destination, which is rank zero, right? And then tag is the additional information and basically our communicator. And guess what? If I send something, if I throw the ball, if I initiate the pong now here, we need someone to listen to this. We need someone that is ready to receive. And of course, that should be the matching rank here, which is rank zero, awaiting one MPI char from the source, which is one. And, and so on and so on. And I could look what's happening later on when you go into when the ping and the pong was happening here. I can with MPI get count some information what really was basically going over the wire in terms of how many uh, chars were really received uh, from which task to when. And this is already um, an interesting part that this is a very simple ping and pong um, application admittedly. But of course, think about that this is now a real message exchange. So here you have two processes that don't have access to each other memory. So they explicitly send this with the MPI protocol over the wire in a send and receive. So now we have the first really parallel program that kind of tackles a real problem in a cooperative way, if you want, even if it's just a ping and a pong. But as I said also, if you have just one process, making yourself a ping and a pong is not really useful. And here we start thinking, why is it actually useful to, to actually have different ranks? Why it is useful to have different processes? Because then the different processes can be differently defined to do different things. Still, we want to do it in a cooperative way. So some of these must match. And you will notice this in much more later lectures and basically our later assignments that will come in the course. So still very much introductionary here, but essentially the essence of a ping and pong. Shortly switching to the slides, um, basically, obviously, this is all what I also more or less describe here on the slides as practical lecture. I don't go in all the different uh, details here. And the idea of your assignment is, of course, to study this a bit more, to execute it yourself, to play around with yourself. Essentially, the same message I told you, a send needs a matching receive and the way around for realizing the ping and the pong. And then, of course, a status, which gives you a little bit of more information what was happening in the MPI environment, which helps us here also to then give, let's say, a proof out when we execute it if there was really something happening. Right. One example is that in message will be filled. We never defined what the in message is. Right. There's no initialization on the in message, only on the out message. So when we would hear basically thinking about that nothing would take care and nothing would happening, we would never get here. Let's say um, what what type of actually things were going over the wire. One example. And basically the MPI source and receive will get us then meta information on the environment. I also told you um, to basically how we, um, you know, go along now with the different uh, compilation of, so here, of course, there's no um, big surprise uh, because we have already loaded the module. That's clear here a little bit. Um, we have load the right modules. I can still do this um, to be really explicit here, new and open MPI. You don't have to do this if you have to do it, done it once again, but just, for people in the maybe YouTube video, just just sneak in here at that time. This is maybe important. So then we have this C compiling, which is essentially very much the same way we have seen already in the Hello MPI example, and we'll have our ping pong. So this is now compiled. We see here um, now the new executable ping pong, which we of course should use in our job script. So we have a job script for that. In a moment, we think a ping and a pong with two processes might be quite useful. That's why we specify here a two. 
And you see again, the environment still needs to be loaded because then we move from the U2 login node to two of the compute nodes, or in this example, maybe in one of the nodes on two cores. Um, still, we execute this ping pong in a cooperative fashion. So they will exchange information and we should see this with a status message we just observed, uh, basically when we do the ad stretch and run this example, ping pong. Let's look a little bit what's happening on the cluster. So luckily I am basically here alone and have lots of resources at my disposal. And then can actually see here again, the, the idea of really having here the ping pong executed. And of course, our, uh, the idea that this is a very, very simple code. It might be already given the output very quickly. If you remember, we had the job ID ending with a 90. That's how we do it in power of computing and in practice. You basically don't keep the whole ID here. Uh, in your mind, you usually look on the last couple of digits. Yeah, usually the like, last two, always you can differentiate very quickly um, that is yours. Um, and of course, here we see that's the output to it. So it's a 90 at the end. Um, and then we see that this was actually working. So again, reflecting the ping basically from task zero, um, but also received one char from task one with tag one. So essentially I got a message from basically task one and task one received of course also from task zero, which means rank zero essentially a char. So with this, we realized the ping and pong and basically see and prove that one char was really going over the wire uh, with a specific tag where you can then identify different message exchanges if you want. So again, switching a little bit to the slides, of course, um, just to show that the most things I just said basically will be on the slides. And once again, when you do this um, basically experimentally in your assignment, you quickly get basically in the modus operandi of it. I just want to point out uh, an important difference here that will be also very important in the second part of the lecture, we notice this minus N in small and the capital minus N we used in the previous ideas of the lecture. Um, basically you, do, you allocate different elements in the scheduler with this. So this is just the number of cores you allocate with a small number, right? And this is important when you look into the idea where exactly on the cluster these are running. Um, and basically the capital minus N will basically refer rather to nodes. So when you come back now, what that means, um, we have to go back to Uton and we realize it has four nodes plus you log in node reset. Then it has two times, two times, this is important, 12 cores, right? So we assume 24 cores in each of the nodes. And basically, when you now look to this ganglia I was alluding to, you see one interesting thing, so that people start really probably with the assignment already or looking into this, we see much more load than the last time. And we see actually here on compute 0 0.2, there seems to be quite some computing happening. And here this Utoon refers, of course, to the login node, where probably we do lots of compiling and lots of elements. So basically, when we zoom into this, um, essentially you see more of this, but now it's important to really realize that we have this different nodes, compute zero, I mean, two, zero, two, one, two, 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 three, four different ones and the login node. So, and what I do with this minus N is of course no steering if I go to different compute nodes here, or if I be within the node and basically just have 12 cores, four cores, two cores and so on. Here's a specific command that helps us there. What I want to demonstrate just a little bit. So when we maybe um, basically take this example now and show you a little bit what the difference would be when we do this between the different nodes, because we're also interested if this works really between the different nodes, right? There's no point of doing massive changes maybe um, when we have, let's say also possibility to have maybe shared memory options and so forth. But um, let's look into this. So here in the submit example we just had, um, we basically have the ping pong with minus N2. So when we now do a specific command, um, which I now take here out of my uh, you know, execution history, remember this is the one where you do this up scrolling 
the basically the arrow up where you then have some information about basically the job possible to obtain it takes a bit longer here so it was uh, some time I used this before and let's do that yeah, yeah. probably instead of this you can of course also do this show uh, job ID minus DD and then we need the job ID which is in our example the one we have executed here sometimes if we wait too long the job ID has not any more information left but you see here we know um, we get much more information about the job of a specific job ID that is here and minus DD is now just how much you basically put out here but you see it very nicely here the idea number of nodes is one so we stay within one node and you actually have here the name yeah compute two zero that we already know from uturn is one of the compute nodes here so all nice and essentially with minus um n in small letters i remain within that space and have just two cpus used two cores used so in this sense this was now a message exchange within the node so how that would change if we go across nodes and this is should be now the example i will do as a set and submit here before we close with this lecture um, we basically have this capital n idea now of saying now we're not anymore having essentially two cores here we specify two nodes and by doing so um, we should also basically see that when we do then this meta information of about what i just told you Obviously, we have to resubmit again. So, I mean, this is a complete new program executed. We basically take, of course, the same application, the same code, but now it's differently executed on the HPC system and we want to make the case with it. Again, we could look in QSTAT how well that come along and we see that 91 is already basically ready for looking. And in other words, um, of course, from the job output perspective, as I said, it's this exactly the same program. So in other words, the output is the same. Up, oh, sorry, for 91. Nope. And out, of course. So of course, we see here the proof it was working, but now by being executed in minus N in capital, we move across nodes. So when we now redo essentially this command I just show you, which is a nice, interesting control where you get lots of information. And of course, change this now to the new one, which is with minus one, uh, basically with 91. Um, we assume now that there will be two nodes. And actually, that's true. Here you see the number of nodes is two. And you even know the node list is compute zero, null, and zero, one. So we have two nodes. Still, of course, we just have cores allocated to. Um, basically with this and we'll do the execution of this but we have here seen now that the message exchange actually works across nodes and that the job is completed nicely and this is of course a key idea now of MPI um, to use this message exchanges really between the different cores but more notably basically between the different nodes just finally before we close the first part of the lecture remember that this of course is something what i have also here in the slide and we will really carry on with much more interesting examples perhaps when we come to collectives in the second part of the lecture